Alrighty, that's a great question, AJ. And it's not a hard question, but it's a question that's difficult to answer in a short way or with one single answer, one single monster. So I'm going to give you guys three monsters that I think are great. So the best monster to throw at a level one party of characters. That's right, of heroes. So I'm going to talk to you about three. The first one in brief I wanted to mention is the kobold. I don't know. I just had the kobolds in mind. Kobolds. Kobold, kobold. I kind of like kobold. Hmm, how do you say it? So... I was sort of debating adding them to this list as they are commonly used for low level characters, but they have a large variety to them. And I'm not just talking about in the D&D world, because in the D&D world, kobolds are sort of reptilian. But then when you look at games and different games and, you know, for example, EverQuest, EverQuest 1, I remember beating up and killing kobolds and they had this hyena kind of wolverine-esque uh, you know, from the weasel family of creatures, more kind of uh, animalistic, primitive body shape, you know, more like a creature hunched over, but they were kind of small, like maybe a foot, two feet tall, and those were pretty cool. I was thinking that'd be awesome just to have that as a pet. So yeah, but then looking into human history and legends, the kobold has a totally different apparent, uh, appearance, and it's seen as a sort of spirit. And when you look at the old images and uh, surrounding the older stories of the kobold, it has more of this goblin-esque or gremlin sort of look to it with the pointy long nose and the ears kind of fey type of uh, appearance to it, although of course it's quite a malevolent creature. So because of all this variety we have all over the place with the kobold, I think it's easy and it's fair enough, it's logical to be able to create your own kobolds and subspecies of kobolds with different sorts of hides and and you know scales and skins to them and sizes even. Since we see kobolds from this kind of more animalistic figure shape to them, to this more bipedal uh, appearance to it, such as in D&D, or as I've mentioned with the, the legendary history of it. So that gives us a lot of room to play with, from mammal-esque with fur to totally reptilian and cold-blooded, such as the ones in D&D. So I think that leaves you a lot of space to create your own kobolds and your own subspecies of kobolds to introduce into the game and give your heroes a little bit of fun with. It definitely beats goblins and bugs for me for the most part, as those are so largely used, and, and other smaller animals that you will put in the games, and that you see in games that, you know, beginner characters fight. Next, I want to talk about demons. That'll be my number two. My number, my second answer to this question is demons, and I have to talk about demons, because I was thinking of something that, which has a, a high population. If you got characters, you know, like when you play an MMO or something, you're always going out, and you're a lot of stuff and uh, you're usually dealing with pests so when I was thinking of some kind of pest creature I was th I had a few creatures in mind but then I was like you know I want more variety do them to them I don't want every one of them to just look green or every one of them look like a giant beetle or bee or something I wanted something where each one can have more variety and demons equal variety there's so many kinds and they are just that that representation of a pest, you know, uh, the, the small demons. I mean, demons can be huge and high levels, but there are those small, low-level demons, and I'll give you some examples at the end of this little review and introduction or discussion of them. So I picked them because they reminded me, again, of invasive species such as we have in this reality, where we have the cane toad that was introduced to Australia, or the Burmese python or wild pigs that are introduced from other countries into a different country and then can create quite a bit of destruction in the ecological system of that region. So I think demons are those kind of creatures. Maybe they follow a particular hero that did a wrong thing or lied or something and there was a demon present or that kind of spirit. So it followed them into a new region, a new village or a farm or something and then it just started duplicating. In whatever manner you think demons duplicate, are we talking about breeding such as other creatures or through other methods such as fire and chemical reactions out there with their attitudes or, or breeding directed mentality? Like for example, there's a lot of demons that are elemental based, so maybe they need some ice 
or fire or certain specific things in their environment to breed into. Maybe it's not just the opposite sex. Maybe it's specific elements and things like that. And like I said, a kind of chemical reaction. Plus, there's summoning as well. So you're going to have like demon bosses and lords that can come by and, and start summoning more. Uh, of course, depending on the environment, it could add to how many will be summoned. And so that just it seems like it's a race, it's a creature type, it's a monster type that has the ability to really reproduce fast. And that's what I was looking for, because level 1 characters, they need to battle through a lot of stuff. So demons seem like it would be a great creature to introduce in high numbers, small sizes, but a lot of cool little creations. So let's jump into the to some species, some... Could we call them species? Sure, why not? There's some types of these demons that I'm talking about. So first we got the Chasme, the Chasme. I like to say Chasme, but it's probably Chasme or Chasm, maybe. But yeah, take a look at that one. Then we got the Dretch. Hmm. Then we got the Mains, the Quasit, and many more in the D&D world and outside. Remember, you look at Japan. There's so many monsters in Japan, but how many demons come from Japan lore and history? It's like every monster that doesn't have a specific name, it's just called a demon. So I think a demon is another word for a monster that hasn't been sort of classified. Sometimes heroes or demonologists or monsters their researchers, maybe they find some new monster creature, really strange. They don't have a name for it, they just call it demon because it's so easy just to place that name on a monster. But maybe some of these demons are miscategorized, so just something to think about. All right, let's go to creature number three, and I've been thinking about this one, and at the end I realized how powerful it is. So, I'm speaking about the Formian Queen. Formian Queen, check that out. Basically, I'm not saying introduce this specific creature to the game, but something lesser, but in comparison to this, with the similar nature. So I'm talking about a huge, like, insect queen that, you know, works with the hive mind and controls all the other creatures out there. You know, like Tyranids, but we're going much, much smaller in scale. And I thought this would be a great little introduction for le a level one group because first they got to battle through tons of insects and when we talk about bugs and insects and in D&D and whatever else you know in the fantasy world we're talking bugs like this we're disgusted by little cockroaches this big that's not so little but for heroes it is that's pretty small and, and centipedes ooh, giant centipedes well imagine a two-foot centipede or cockroach that you know crawling up your leg that weighs as much as your puppy Puppy, that's small. That's as much as your, your bulldog, you know? Something like that. And then big, grotesque worms and ugly grubs and stuff like that. Battling through that is going to really test the, the heroes, I think. And in this reality, when you think of the most scary, disgusting things, people always talk about spiders. I consider centipedes pretty threatening just because of their nature. Their, their eyesight's weak, so they depend on their antennae. And you can't really predict their nature because of that. Then there's the undead. So that's another good one to test your heroes with. The undead can be introduced, I think, level 1, maybe level 2. But insects, let's get those in there and we'll, you know, find out who's the weakling in the group. And once we battle through all those insects in that cave, in those tunnels, and we've made it through, we battled with brawn, now it's time to test our teamwork, more of our brawn, and our psychology, our mind-battling ways. Not just psychology, I mean our magical ways too. So we put these those other characters really to use now. Not just blasting things, but dealing with something more intelligent. And that's where this Formian Queen concept comes in, because it's that high you know, queen. It keeps producing eggs and it's immobile. So that's great because now these level one characters are dealing with a powerful creature but it's mobile, or it's very slow. So that'll give them time to regroup, think of another strategy to attack it with, and plan that out and execute it. Uh, but it, then again, it also has the intelligence, it has the hive mind, that it has psyche attacks and different things like that, and can manipulate the characters, possibly. So, I'm not really talking about the Formian Queen specifically, she's a bit too powerful for level 1, way too powerful. But I'm talking about that concept. And we see that concept already a lot in movies, and it made me kind of rethink if I want to introduce this. 
but I say yeah because it just gives your team a great first boss, possibly to kind of surround and use a strategy and really see and cooperate together. Use that teamwork together to destroy something that's not going to keep interrupting them and breaking them apart. At level one, we need to start getting to know each other. And working together, and I think that's that first test to see: Are they going to make through? Who's going to, you know, jump out of the group and go on a, on their own? They, it's too powerful to sort of handle by themselves. So it's really going to depend on that. And again, the babies serve as the babies, the the small insects. Maybe it's a variety of insects that, that it produces. You know, maybe it's not just one type. So all those creatures, those babies, will create awesome foes and monsters. For the level ones to battle through first, where they can repeat, but it makes sense why they repeat because eventually we get to the source, so it doesn't just become monotonous with all this whole land surrounded with these one creature. It's because there's a queen out somewhere, and you know, just tests all levels and sides of your heroes. All right, and the last one I want to talk about. Oh, I'm done. That's it. Those three. So I talked to you guys about kobolds, kobolds, demons, and finally something of that insectoid queen type, such as the Formian queen. Last but not least, I want to leave you with some awesome images of some honorable mentions, honorable mentions of level ones and about level twos, because of course, you know, a good group can beat up a level two, maybe even a couple heroes. So here you are. We've got the Azer. Pretty cool creature of the fire realms. We got the magmen. Ooh, another one. And madrones, madrones, so awesome. Imagine your heroes stumbling into an old study where everything's alive, where it seems alive, where it's undead, where it's just electric, whatever it is. It's magic. So, but imagine that. That would wake your heroes up. It would keep them alert. The rest of the adventure. What a great test to just, ah, you know, wake up the mentality and make heroes realize. They're a freaking hero. Nothing's normal in their life now. It's not going into a study anymore, picking up a book. You don't know if this book's gonna try to bite your arm off, or if there's some entity watching out for you. This is the life of a hero, and that's what you've entered. And if you pass through these first courses in level one, you've made it to the well, the level two. You haven't made it to the big guns yet. So you've made it to level two, but maybe by this time you should know if you're really cut out for this line of work. Even if it doesn't pay much, it's all about the passion. It's all about the passion, baby. All right. Continuing, we got the Nothic, or Nothic. Then we got the check that out, Quagoth, Quagoth, and then the Ettercap, the Flumph, and the Docenus. Oh, and don't forget. I had to just add this one, and I mean, we got dire and large insects and all that, and giant spiders, but giant fleas. That's right, giant fleas. Ooh, that's an ooh, that's an interesting one. So, hope you guys. I uh, hope this answer was to your satisfaction. Thank you, AJ, for the question. And Locrius, it's your turn. My question to you is: If you had to choose some kind of monster to make playable as a character. Not some humanoid or elvish. I'm talking some monster. Which monster would you choose to make a playable character?